Here she is, the finished embroidery. Sewing. And then we're going to impale the chalk. Would I be crazy to want to add more rhinestones to this thing? Yes! This project has been a labor of love. Emphasis on the labor. And after more than two months of it, we're finally ready to see the Baroque unicorn in all its flashy glory. Are you excited? Cause I'm ecstatic. Several months ago, I was struggling to come up with a theme for my 1660s gown that I wanted to make this year. And one morning as I was doom scrolling over on Instagram, as one does. I came across a post from Taylor, AKA Dames a la Mode, who was showing off some fun, sparkly, non-historically accurate jewelry and saying, hey, I'd love to see some historical unicorns up in this joint. Well, I was in such a state of shock, I completely blacked out, I don't remember a thing. It wasn't until I was running the jewelry through my hands, I even realized I'd committed. And so the idea was born. But of course it's fantastical follies and there's no pastel pretty princess stuff happening here. So it's gonna be a dark unicorn. So we've already built the gown and that consists of a petticoat and a pair of bodies, which is the 17th century equivalent of a corset or a pair of stays. If you've missed that, you can find that video and all of the rest of them in the series in the playlist that I've linked in the description below. So since now we're all caught up, why don't we start off where I last left you when I got the insane but wonderful idea to fully embroider the center front of the bodice. I took inspiration from one of the embroidery patterns from the 17th century women's dress patterns, books, and drew out my design onto the center front pattern piece. The dots are sequins on the extant garment. Mine will be glass pearls. With two pieces of tracing paper in the center, I folded the design and began to trace the pattern onto the silk. This wasn't entirely successful and I ended up having to redo it with Taylor's chalk several times. I then proceeded to embroider the front using some DMC Diamant floss I had lying around from another project. I somehow forgot to film this entire portion, so here's a very accurate dramatization for your viewing pleasure. Here she is, the finished embroidery. Notice that there isn't actually any embroidery down on the point. That's because it's gonna be completely covered up with lace, so why bother? All right, so now this is taken care of. We're gonna go ahead and add her to the center front of our bodice. As awkward as it's gonna be, make sure your busk is inside your bodice for this bit. Pin the center front seam onto the center front of your bodice. Note that originally I didn't want to trim the center front, but I forgot to cut this on the fold and now I wanna cover up the seam. Thoroughly secured via backstitch, Ghost Rider. Smooth and stretch the fashion fabric out over the bodice structure and pin at the underarms. Then turn under the pesky curve seam and press it good. It's important to stretch this out over a bolster pillow or your thigh to sew it down to avoid wrinkling of the fashion fabric. Then a quick trim of the raw edges. This silk I'm using frays really bad. Once the ends are snipped, we'll go ahead and add some twill tape all along the upper edge. This helps keep the center back tight and close to the body while wearing, as well as preventing the edges of the fabric from fraying, in theory. So my town is in the path of totality for the eclipse and my best friend from high school is one of the two million extra people that have flown in for the event. So while all of this sewing is going on, I'm also in absolute panic mode, trying to get everything clean and ready for my friend's visit. Just, you know, no pressure. 
Instead of doing this the easy way and just sewing on the gold lace, this crazy person decided to bedazzle the lace instead. I had a bag of rhinestones that just matched the inspiration jewelry, so it seemed like fate. First order of business was to measure out the length of lace for the bedazzlement. I bought these rhinestones to make my mage's cloak and they were supposed to be hot fix, but they weren't, so they went in the stash. To get these on the lace, I'm going to use gem tack. I found a tutorial that suggested using a pin to dollop on the glue. It wasn't until four hours later, when most of the lace was already done, that I realized I could just dab the glue using the fine tip. Last night, I finished bedazzling the lace for the front. You'll notice that I added pearls to these instead of just the rhinestones. And that was mostly because I was worried I wasn't gonna have enough rhinestones. I didn't wanna have to buy a whole nother pack. Although I only used about half of them, so I probably would have been good, but that's okay. I have pearls on the embroidery anyway, and pearls were definitely a thing in the 17th century. So I think we're cool. We'll first attach the lace to the center front of the petticoat. Attach using just a basic running stitch. Once the center fronts are down, then go back and add two more strips of lace at the top and bottom of the blue strip. Then onto the bodice. Unsurprisingly, the curved seam isn't quite as easy to get flat. Okay, so I just got back from my four mile walk and I'm gross and grody and the light is fading, but we need to have a talk. I have been reluctant to bring the subject up and I have just been quietly going into the comments and deleting the offending statements, but it's increasing at an alarming rate. It is not appropriate in any kind of context to comment on somebody's weight or size without a direct question. Like if I'm walking up to you and I'm like, does this make my butt look big? Then by any means, tell me it looks big if it looks big. That is the only time that it is an appropriate thing to say to somebody. And I don't just mean me, I mean anyone. Now, one of the reasons I've been reluctant to say this is because every single person who has made this comment has been doing it in a way that they think is positive. Everyone for the most part has been extremely supportive and encouraging. I do wanna acknowledge that and I wanna say that I appreciate your good intentions. I don't wanna make people feel bad. I always wanna make people feel like they can talk to me in the comments. I love a discussion and I don't wanna discourage that. And if you watch these videos and you see me and can identify with me because of my size, because of my shape. I love that for you. And especially in something like sewing where we're dealing with bodies, it helps to see the changes and things that people make if they are similar to you. However, even if your intentions are the best in saying, hey, you look like me, I really love that. You're still going down to the comments and saying, hey, you're fat. And I just like you to take a minute and think about how you would feel if some complete stranger walked up to you without conversation or content Text and said that to you. And it works in the opposite way too. How would you feel if somebody criticized you for being too skinny? You don't know what my life has been like, what trauma I may or may not be carrying, what I may or may not be dealing with right now, what is necessarily going to trigger me or cause me harm. In addition, you don't know who else is reading the comments, what they've been through, what trauma they have, and what might trigger or hurt them. There's a reason that content creators like me put content warnings and content notes on stuff like this and it is because we don't want to cause other people harm. And that is also the reason why I'm going to ask you not to comment about this discussion in the comments. We don't want to trigger anyone who may or may not have skipped this. Even if you agree with what I say and especially if you don't agree with what I say, please do not go into the comments and state that. That is not welcome and it will get deleted. Please be considerate. Remember that there is a person on the other side of this camera. Remember that feelings can get hurt. I want to keep this a positive experience for everyone. I'm gonna go get out of these sweaty clothes and let's get back to the regularly scheduled program. Thank you for listening. Shall we begin?
To my knowledge, there are no more extant mid 17th century overskirts left for us to study. But this means that nobody really knows how they're made. And probably one of the reasons you see a lot of costumers recreating gowns from this era without the overskirts. However, starting in the 1660s and moving through the rest of the century, while these gowns were still popular, overskirts were part of the fashionable ensemble. I do intend in the future to make a real pattern for an overskirt, but since this is my first try, I want to practice a little first before I make that commercially available. The short and sweet of it, it's a trained skirt constructed similarly to the petticoat on the selvages. The train at the back should be about 10 inches longer than the front of the overskirt, which should hit at about floor level. So here are my pieces, two of the shorter length and one of the longer. Normally these overskirts would have been made of something much heavier weight, but I thought the floatiness of the organza would be apropos for a unicorn. Seam them together just like the petticoat. Because this is organza and a slippery monster of doom, I'm going to starch the bottom before cutting to make my life a little bit easier. You may also want to stabilize the bottom edge by pinning everything together. If you're working with appropriate overskirt fabric, this probably won't be necessary. And now, a very scientific cutting method. Yep, scientific. Finish all your raw edges. At this point, you should be ready to cartridge pleat, but we're fantastical follies and therefore overcomplicate everything. And I've got just enough of this gold lace left over to trim the entire hem of the overskirt. So I think that's enough rhinestones to cover that length of lace. Would I be crazy to want to add more rhinestones to this thing? Yes! And just for that comment, she's volunteered herself as tribute. Here it is, friends. The home stretch with every single last rhinestone on my plate. Will we make it? Nine left. We used 1,143 rhinestones. Because of the fray rate of this silk, I decided to serge the arm side. If this looks awkward and awful, that's because it is, but it'll add so much stability where I need it most. Couldn't quite get it through because of the stones, so I zigzagged this bit on the regular machine. Unlike my gingham wearable mock-up, I'm going to go ahead and leave the peekaboo slit in the sleeves like the extant garment. This is a common design choice I've seen in most paintings, where the sleeve is open at least once to show off the chemise underneath. So fold the edge of both sides of the sleeve and tack down the edges. At this point, the back sleeve seam can be sewn together on the machine or by hand if you prefer. It looks really weird right now, I know, but stick with it, I promise. The curved edge of the wing attaches to the arm side. The straight edge of the wing attaches to the sleeve. Now on the extant garment, the wing laps over the seam allowance of the arm side, but for some reason I've decided to do it the harder way by matching right sides together and sewing on the seam line. This is a heck of a lot easier if you have all of your register marks marked. You did mark them, right? Right?
So I'm running on about four hours of sleep today. After four or five days of entertaining and staying up late and having fun, after a full week of panic cleaning my apartment, and I keep looking at the mess of things that I still need to get done in order to get this video out to you in time. And the problem is, is that my body is saying, get it all done and get this finished. And my brain is going, sewing. So what do you do when you're exhausted and you're up against the deadline? The most productive thing that you can do is to not do anything or to just give yourself a break. I am going to do only things that I can do as a zombie. And that is basically marking and sewing cartridge pleats because that requires no brains. Assembling the sleeve is pretty straightforward. The sleeve is held together by grosgrain ribbon at the cuff. I'm using some twill tape, which I plan to cover with a little scrap of blue silk. The cuff is what holds the chemise gap in place. And since I apparently filmed almost the entire sleeve attaching completely out of frame because I fail, let's just skip to looking at the final sleeve. Ooh, ah, puffy. No unicorn costume is complete without a horn. So let's make one. I cannot get through a section where we're making a horn without making the occasional entendre. You've been warned. Now, originally I was just going to buy the headdress. It's a huge suck of time. I have so much to do in this costume, but every single one for sale that I found on Etsy or Amazon or my other places looked, let's just say indecent. And I think the only solution here to not look like I've got one of those things on my head is to make it very long and very skinny. So now we're gonna take our childhood Play-Doh skills, a little bit of Sculpey clay, and get this thing molded and ready for baking. So I'm just using some basic white Sculpey. So you'll need a chunk. You'll also need a skewer. First, we're going to just roll this out a little bit to get like a chunk. And then we're going to impale the chunk right down the middle. That's not the middle. There we go. That's still not the middle. There. Okay. Okay. So now we have what looks like a giant marshmallow on a skewer. From here, we're going to roll it out. Now you don't necessarily have to use a skewer, but I'm going to stabilize the center just in case it gets a little um, floppy. So I've decided to keep the hole in there now so that I don't have to worry about it later. Okay, so when you're rolling it out, you want to taper it. So you want it thicker on one side and thinner at the other. So when you get it to a little bit shorter than the length that you want, then we can start twisting. You don't have to twist. You could just, you know, roll this out and have a smooth horn, but I kind of like the twisty. Okay, so when you get it to the length that you want, we'll just take both hands and twist in opposite directions. Twist. Twist, twist, twist. This doesn't look good. This is really hard for me to do on camera. So that is the general idea of it. Twist, and you can twist it a lot and get like lots of twisties. Ooh, lots of twisties. Once you get it to a shape you like, bake it per the instructions on a bed of cornstarch to avoid unwanted shininess. Warning now, kids. Austin Powers would be proud. Yeah, baby! We are nice and twisty. That was definitely harder than I anticipated it. The lady who did it on the tutorial made it look so much easier than it actually was. Let's go ahead and get her painted and sparkly. Now we'll jab some scrap Milner's wire into the hole to keep it, well, you know. And we'll squirt some glue up there just for good measure. A 
I struggled to figure out a way to keep the horn on my head, but I decided eventually to make it a detachable part of the tiara so that I could get in and out of my car without difficulty. I'll also add a comb to help keep it secure. Except this failed miserably. So we're going to have to compromise and put the horn onto the headband with the flowers. This really wasn't the look I wanted, but sometimes you just gotta compromise. You definitely want a comb on this thing to help keep it stable and on your head. Note that there's only one firm rule in tiara making, and that's making sure to wire it well and using liberal amounts of hot glue to secure everything in place. After pre-washing the fabric in Simpapal, I soaked it in a citric acid solution to help fix the dye. It's essential you wear gloves while working with acid dyes since they dye protein fibers like your skin. And we're working with a highly concentrated version of the dye here. You may also want to put straws in your beverages for the long haul. Here we are before the painting. Thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone who donated on my Ko-fi page while we were raising funds for this gown. Accepting the supplies I already had on hand, this costume was entirely funded by my supporters. This is one of my dream projects, one of my dream gowns to make, and it could not have happened without you. Cheers to all of you, and I cannot wait to toast you in the Champagne Mountain. My whole goal for the overskirt was to create sort of an oil slick rainbow effect, which we're going to do with a fun silk painting technique using acid dyes. Now this is a more advanced dyeing technique, which we don't have the full space in this video to really dive deep into. But if that's something you would like a dedicated video for, let me know in the comments and go ahead and give this video a nice thumbs up. 1660s and later overskirts would have been constructed from similar fabric to the rest of the gown, but I picked organza for two specific reasons. One, because it was ethereal and floaty, which to me evokes the unicorn. And also because organza has this unique property where dye doesn't bleed and create a watercolor effect, unlike a lot of other silks, which is going to give me a more defined sort of oil slick vibe, which is what I'm going for. Once everything is dry, roll it up in some paper or old sheets, making sure that none of the fabric touches itself or is exposed outside of the roll. I'm doing this very sloppy. There will be regrets. Then place the roll inside of your steamer and cover the lid with a towel to prevent condensation dripping on your fabric. Then let it steam like a tasty lobster for a full hour. So this happened during the steaming process, and it is all over one side of the skirt and a little bit on the other. That happens when the wrapping fabric gets wet and the dye migrates. I should have not tried to steam set this last night at 9 p.m. when I was tired, but that's what I did. So I'm just gonna have to patch it up and live with it. We're at that point where I'm just done. It's just taken so long to do. It's been a struggle from the moment I started. I haven't even worn the thing and it's already starting to come apart at the top. I'm just done. Two months is too long for one project. And that's the truth, at least for me. After several hours of touching up the silk, waiting for it to dry, re-steam setting it, rinsing out the excess dye, and letting it dry one more time, it was finally ready for the waistband. I have no idea how they made the waistbands for the overskirts in the 1660s, so I'm winging it. This organza is too lightweight to cartridge pleat, so I machine gathered it instead before pinning it to the waistband. The very last thing to do was to sew on that final strip of gold lace to the edge of the overskirt, and she was officially finished.
Jackie! Jackie! You're so fun and sparkly, Jackie! Yeah! Come with us to the Champagne Mountain, Jackie! It's fun and sparkly! Yeah! Alright, alright, fine. Jackie! Jackie! We're in a forest, Jackie! There it is! The Champagne Mountain! Go get the champagne! It's not a mountain. That's a ledge with a bottle of champagne on it. No! It's the Champagne Mountain! Alright, fine. Fine, just leave me alone. <laughs> Wait, what? Uh... <gasps> they took my freaking costume! <laughs> like that! <laughs> Are you ready? <laughs> it is recording right now, right? Yeah. That's okay, I edit this. I think you should have, like... <laughs> Outtakes. <laughs> there might be.